Hey everybody, welcome, welcome back. This is the third class of our 2019 Food Literacy for All. We're so, thank you so much for coming out. We know it's uh, in the single digits and plummeting tonight, so we really appreciate everyone trekking out here and please bundle up and be safe. Um, that said, I just wanna say that normally when we have speakers, almost always, you know, this is, a, this is a Michigan winter class and we always have speakers coming from across the country and internationally, and usually we always have to apologize to speakers for the terrible weather. Um, this week, unbelievably, so Sean, Sean, Chef Sean Sherman is coming in from Minneapolis, and this is really, this is really like a blast of heat for him. So we really, we really don't need to apologize at all. This is like a sunny, warm vacation. Um, so a few announcements and reminders before we get going. Uh oh no, I'm going to be the one with the issue here. Um, real quick, I want to thank our sponsors again for each week. So this course is organized by the University of Michigan Sustainable Food Systems Initiative. And we have support from the School for Environment and Sustainability, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Center for Engaged Academic Learning, and the Center for the Education of Women, Francis and Sydney Lewis Visiting Leaders Fund. Thank you so much to our sponsors. Um, a couple of quick reminders, announcements again. This class is half students who are enrolled in the class and half community members, meaning anyone can attend. You don't have to be enrolled in the class. Um, thank you so much to all of you who RSVP to come. It's free. We just ask that you RSVP. It's really important for us to know who is coming, and particularly as this course does take quite a bit of resources to put on, it's really important for us to know who's coming and who we're reaching, and we'll use that to um, help make the course happen in future years. But again, if you are an enrolled student, this does not apply to you. You don't need to RSVP. Um, we have, uh, just a reminder, we have four shuttles, free shuttles coming in from Detroit throughout the semester. So this week, our shuttle actually just had an issue and is, had to switch drivers. They're on their way. They're going to be here in about 20 minutes. Um, so we'll welcome our Detroiters who are braving the cold to join us in just a few. Um, Mama Jerry is also offering herself as a ride from Detroit. So if you, um, other weeks, if you want to come when there's no shuttle, you can catch a ride with Mama Jerry. <laughs> Um, again, another quick reminder that the local food summit is happening here in Washtenaw County on February 16th, and the um, Yvette Perfecto, who's a faculty member here at U, U of M, is going to be the keynote. She's an agroecologist at the School for Environment and Sustainability. She's a great speaker. Um, and also, there's a Detroit food summit coming up that's going to be March 7th and March 8th. We'll send out, for the students enrolled in the class, we will send out a reminder with um, informa more information if you would like to attend and we it's put on by the Detroit Food Policy Council who are our community partners in this course so we really hope you can make it um, I'll let Sean talk about that okay now I'm gonna invite up Mama Jerry to invite our to announce our speaker Hello. Hello. Oh, y'all got that. <laughs> nice to see you all. And again, I'm grateful that we're here, brave the cold, and that we made it safe. And that I'm going to ask you to continue to be safe even after you leave. Make sure you bundle up really warm. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Chef Sean Sherman who was born in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, and has been cooking indigenous foods across the United States and world for more than 30 years. Chef Sean has completed extensive research in the area of Native American farming, wild food harvesting, land stewardship, hunting and fishing, and more. In 2014, Chef Sean la launched his business, the, the Sous Chef. As a caterer and educator in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, Chef Sean and his vision of modern indigenous foods has been featured in numerous uh, art classes, radio shows, along with the James Beard house in Manhattan and Milan. Chef Sean has shared his 
uh, knowledge with crowds across the country uh, at Yale University, the Culinary Institute of America, the United Nations, and many more. The sous chef team's mission is to educate and make indigenous foods more accessible to as many communities as possible. And so with that in mind, I'd like to welcome our speaker tonight, Chef Sean. All right. Can you guys hear me? Is the microphone on? Good? Yeah. You guys in the back? Good? All right. So I know we're going to jump into a couple of questions first, right? Because you guys know what this is about, and this is all new to me. Um, so how this works, basically, you guys, do you guys actually have clickers? Do you have, like, I picture, like, little yellow or red clickers. I, I want to see one. All right. <laughs> what do you guys win? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody sitting in the front row gets a free book tonight. Everybody. Thought, oh. <laughs> I guess that's you. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do this first question. Um, is there a way? Do you, do you like see the results when yeah, it comes up? No, it comes up oh, okay. All right, so when do we know when it's done? How, how much time am I given? Um, it'll, it's just going to pop up in, a, in another. We'll wait when the second is done. The first one will take longer because everyone's getting out of the back end. Oh, I see. I gotcha. You have to talk now. All right, so click it. Yeah. All right. So then it just kind of pops up right in the hoops. All right. Well, that was correct for the most, or I guess everybody who guessed it correct got it correct. <laughs> the answer was B. All right. Um, so we're going to do this next one. Um, oops. So there's the answer. Um, that's OK. So I got it down. I'm a pro, pro at this now. All right. So which of these are not native to North America? Cedar, wild rice, dandelion, sweet grass. And this is just all automatic. All right. There we go. Dandelions. And uh, yeah, we actually don't know when dandelions came into North America for sure. There's kind of uh, quite a few different histories that could have happened there. So um, how many tribes exist in the United States today is this question. There needs to be some like Jeopardy music or something for this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the answer is actually E. There are 573 tribes in the U.S. right now. And next one, what about um, how many tribes exist in Canada? Yep, most of you guys did pretty well on that one also. So the answer is E. There's 622 tribes in Canada. Um, which food was introduced to America after 1492?
All right, well, that one was a much tougher one because that one was a trick one. Those were all foods that were here and didn't exist anywhere else. <laughs> all right, oops. Which tribe is not from the land Michigan now sits upon? I want to sing. I don't really want to sing. <laughs> All right. Well, that the so E was the answer to that one. Arapaho is the tribe. They're out towards uh, Wyoming, Colorado, a little bit of Nebraska, Dakota. So, but yeah, it's good to know. Good to see what people know, right? Um, oh, there's another one. How many native restaurants exist in New York City, LA, Detroit, and Chicago combined? did pretty good on that one so the answer is a there are actually zero native restaurants in all of those cities combined today <laughs> all right so I think that's up for that and then we're gonna hopefully jump into this okay all right my name is Sean Sherman um, I grew up on Pine Ridge Reservation um, how many people know where Pine Ridge Reservation is Good, some of you. So Pine Ridge Reservation is in South Central South Dakota. How many people know where South Dakota is? <laughs> um, I live right now in sunny Minneapolis. And uh, you know, I think tomorrow our high is minus 15 and our low is minus 30, something like that. And that's without the wind chill. So that's, that, and that's not even bad because people who live in the northern part of the state, they've already been doing that for weeks on end already. So, but they're probably like in the minus 50s, 60s this week. So it's cold. Um, I've been a chef, uh, I've, been, I've been in the kitchens most of my life. I didn't actually mean to become a chef, it just kind of happened to me. Um, I started working in restaurants when I was 13, living in the Black Hills. My mom moved us off, my sister and I, off the reservation when I was uh, um, just before high school. And I started working in restaurants right away, because like a lot of families coming off the reservation, we were pretty poor. My mom was going to school at Black Hill State University and um, taking on three jobs and trying to raise us at the same time. And who even knows what the minimum wage was at that time in South Dakota in the early 80s, basically, right? Mid 80s. So I started working in restaurants as soon as I could, and I did restaurants all through high school, all through college. And right after college, I moved to Minneapolis. And within a few years, I worked my way up into a chef position in the city. So I've been a chef in the city in Minneapolis since around the year 2000 and I got lucky because I started working farm to table stuff right away even when it was kind of up and coming back then so back in those early days which you know it's not super early but back then farm to table is still kind of a new concept for a lot of people um, so when I remember like meeting with a, like five other chefs around the entire city working with some of the farmers and ranchers around us and trying to figure out how to get that supply chain from outside inside instead of having to go through you know the, the monopolies which were the big box trucks you know the Cisco's and US foods and things like that and so it took a lot of time and effort to try to figure out systems of how to make it sustainable for everybody to do, utilize this and to train the chefs on how to use some of these different project products and stuff like that. So I had a pretty good chef career in the city for a few years, but then all of a sudden, um, partway into my, like maybe six, five years into my chef career, six years of my chef career, I had the realization all of a sudden that, you know, I, you know, I was li living in Minneapolis, it's a pretty cool little food scene there. There's a lot of great restaurants. I was living in kind of a hip part of town and I can walk around, you know, within a few blocks and find food from all over the world in just a small block region, right? Just like here, you can find food from all over the place. But there was nothing that was representing the land and the history of the land that we were standing on. And that was such a big eye opener for me all of a sudden because growing up on Pine Ridge Reservation, 
um, you know, and just being around indigenous peoples most of my childhood, it just didn't all of a sudden make sense because I started looking around and it was the same story everywhere. There was no native restaurants anywhere that I could find, you know, and it was really striking. And I also realized too, as a chef who had studied so much about foods, I could, I could name off hundreds of recipes of European and French recipes and German recipes and all sorts of European recipes and even recipes from other parts around the world. I studied a lot of foods of Japan and uh, different parts of Southeast Asia and Indonesia and I just like had compiled a lot of these recipes by studying food and just being really into food and region and culture and then realizing I didn't even hardly know that much about what my food was right so I really wanted to understand because I could name off just like 10 recipes that I could think of tops uh, what would be Lakota traditional Lakota food without without before it was European right um, and I was looking for foods that didn't have a can of cream of mushroom soup in the recipe, right? Because <laughs> I had started combining, you know, collecting a lot of cookbooks on native foods, and a lot of them were mixed like that. They were, they felt like they were more like Lutheran church recipes than they did their Native American <laughs> recipes. So <laughs> it took a lot of uh, a lot of work to try to dig around, but it shot me on a path. It made me want to understand. I want to know what 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 my ancestors were eating, you know, because I knew my great grandfather was born in the 1850s and lived tradi traditional on the plains. And I wanted to know what they were eating before the European um, influence came in and really understand it. And it seemed so important, you know. And it seemed like there was such a loss of it everywhere. Like nobody was talking about it. No, nobody was, I mean, there was very few people talking about it, I should say. There was some good work before me by far. And, but I just didn't know. I didn't know where to start. That's how I felt when I was going through that stage. Um, so I started um, really looking at indigenous foods. I moved, I lived in Mexico for about a year in a small town north of Puerto Vallarta called San Pancho. And it was a beautiful little town, beach town. Um, and uh, the Huichols were the Huicholes were the uh, indigenous group of that region. And you know, I started seeing this, this connection. So when I first was thinking about it, I was just looking for Lakota. But then I started seeing North America connected through all the indigenous peoples. Um, and I started seeing these histories differently. I started seeing the migration of, of agriculture, how it waved northward and how people in Mexico and people way up here shared corn cultures, right? So there was all of these connections happening, and, um, but I just needed to learn more and more. So I just spent quite a few years understanding and researching until I finally started working for myself and I finally opened up uh, my business called The Sous Chef in 2014 and, and have been able to do just this work. And this work has really helped me grow a lot because we've been able to travel a lot, we've been able to see different communities and different tribes all over the place, see a lot of the same struggles, a lot of the same stories and really see the importance for getting this out there and also knowing that this work was really more important than myself personally and it always was going to be so this was never an ego pro uh, ego driven project which for a lot of culinary uh, all the time it's usually like the chef it's all about the chef it's all about his creativity it's his vision and things like that but this was different this was something that just should have been out there you know I wish somebody in my parents generation had started a lot of this work and really gotten it out there ahead of time because they could have been talking to a lot more elders who could have had a lot more memories to share to pass down a lot of these really important lessons that we could have continued to go so we also look at the reason you know why people don't understand this because no matter where you are in North America um, you know the history begins with oh, that's not working no, no matter where you are in North America, history begins with indigenous histories, right? Because, you know, I have to tell people in Minnesota all the time that history, there's history there before Laura Ingalls. You have to look back a little bit deeper. You don't even have to go back that far to get to that point, right? But you, you know, if all you know about American history is what you learned in high school and in your American or Canadian high school, you're not going to know that much about history because they're not taught us. Like, you know, we're basically learning propaganda um, at that stage in life, right? You have to dig for it a little bit to understand the true stories that are, that are out there about the land that you're standing on. You have to under ask yourself, like, how did I get here, right? You know, I said, that sounds like a talking head song, but basically you have to ask yourself, like, how did I get here? <laughs> and you have to think about that you know you have to understand the migration of things you have to understand how did your family end up here how did other families end up here you know um, how did people move around and it's all part of the history of who we are and you know why does the why do the United States government and the Canadian government not talk about this 
the situation that happened to um, so many people, you know, and how these uh, cultures that were affected, you know, they don't talk about how they built this gigantic country on the back of slaves and, on the ba and, and on, off of stolen land and resources, right? And how many people died for that? And they don't talk about that at all. So it's important to understand these true histories that are out there, right? So I like to start off because we use terms like pre-colonial foods, decolonizing, oh, decolonize, we use it all the time in different situations, okay? But to understand decolonization, um, first you have to understand what is colonialism, number one, right? Because you might know what colonialism is, but we should just start there so we're all on the same page, just to start with. So the best way to understand colonialism is uh, Google, of course. But, you know, it's a policy or practice of acquiring a political, partial, full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers, and exploiting it economically, okay? So we got that, we, and we see this happening all across the world um, in, a, in, in a very short time period in human history, um, especially coming out of Europe. Europe goes crazy, right? So they're all over the place, you know? They're in Africa, they're in India, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, all the Americas, and they're doing the same thing everywhere. They're claiming land that's not theirs, they're stealing natural resources, they're taking human people for slavery and putting them to forced labor, um, and there's all sorts of stuff happening during this time, during this time stretch, right, in human history. But what people always often don't understand is how fast this happens um, where we're standing today, that our country is not very old, right? You know, so this, is, this map starts in 1783, but our country is brand new in 1777, and people have been here for a little while. But at that time period, when the U.S. government's a brand new country, officially independent on their own, they actually only owned that little tiny strip of land, even though they claimed all this big area. You know, all the European forces say, France says, oh, we've got this part. England says they have this part. Spain has this part, you know. But really, in the, in the reality of it, indigenous people are still completely in control of this entire region, right? And it happens really fast when the U.S. government sets its sight on, especially after it becomes independent, on taking over more and more and more of these land masses. So even at the uh, 1800, 80% 80 of, of what is the U.S. is still under indigenous control. And most of it doesn't fall or happen until after the Civil War. So in the years of like 1850 to 1870 is when really the hard stuff really starts to happen, right? So again, thinking of my great grand or my great grandfather born in 1850s, only knowing struggle with the U.S. government as a child and growing up and trying to see the, the, the older people trying to maintain a traditional way of life, right? And moving around, seeing battles. He was in the Battle of Little Bighorn against General Custer when he was 18 years old, um, and then seeing like every his kids getting pushed like. Every, his family's getting pushed onto Pine Ridge Agency, a complete change in lifestyle and tradition, and also seeing his kids eventually go to boarding schools, having to learn English, cut their hair, learn a different religion, and eventually even see his children grow up to fight for the U.S. government, right? It's a crazy thing to witness all in one, one personal lifetime. So I think about how fast and how recent that is. And for indigenous communities, that history is very recent for a lot of us because that happened to our great grandparents' era. And some of it, you know, there, there are probably still some grandparents that have very clean memories of this direct, um, all these atrocities that were happening during that time period because there was a lot happening during that time period. There was, you know, um, multiple massacres that happened in different parts of the country, um, all in the name of land grabbing, basically, when it comes down to it. And harsh punishments were made. It's so like in Minnesota, oops, I need to go back. Sorry. Um, in Minnesota, this is a picture of after the Dakota War in Minnesota, where the Dakota um, rose up and tried to maintain their way of life and tried to kick out a lot of the colonizers that were coming in. Um, and we were eventually defeated and then forced to live in a concentration camp right outside Minneapolis for um, about two years, right? During that time period, and this is in 1860, uh, 1863, 1864, I want to say in 1864, the U.S. government actually passed the Dakota Expulsion Act, it was called, making it illegal for um, any Dakota people to be within the state border of Minnesota at all. 
And that law was actually never reversed. So still today, it's actually illegal for Dakota people to be in their own state homeland, right? And that's crazy. There's all sorts of weird histories like that out there. Um, we also see, because of this rush to get these natural resources, we see this complete destruction of so much of our landscape so fast, complete deforestation happening all across this region, Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. You know, think about the redwoods, right? So today there's less than 10% of the old growth redwoods out there. Um, and back then, like the peoples who lived with the redwoods, like I have an aunt who's a full Yurok and she grew up in the communities that they Red, you know, they lived with the redwoods in the northern part of California. And those families never had to cut down a tree because they knew how to live sustainably with those trees because they knew how to harvest wood from those trees without ever having to kill one. And they built everything with them, you know, longhouses as big as this room and all sorts of stuff, all their canoes and tools. And they were symbiotic with those forests out there. But within 10 years, people cut them all down, you know, I mean, not within 10 years, but, you know, by the 1900s, they started just wiping out those forests, you know, and the sake of stealing, make, having these new resources and making tons of money. So you still see a lot of small towns, especially along rivers, have their startups from lumber barons and things like that all across these upper northwestern regions and these woodland areas. Um, so we look at how this was happening and like what was going on during this time period. We see really this war on indigenous food happening um, because it's just a part of warfare. You know, if you take out somebody's food system, then it makes them easier to succumb when, you're, when they're going to battle against them, right? So we see um, George Washington doing this. Um, one of the first things he does was send General Sullivan out to take out a lot of the tribes in the Northeast and you know, pushing people up towards Canada and taking over all these really rich farmlands that they had been farming on for a long, long time, right? We see the destruction of the bison, you know, in the middle of the country, because there was millions of these animals out there. And again, most of these bison were killed in that very short time period in the 1850s and 1860s and 1870s, because uh, there was advances in weaponry and long range rifles and stuff like that. And they just slaughtered so many of these animals, which so many tribes on the plains were utilizing for a very important food source for all sorts of stuff. Um, so, and it's really important to think that food can be that powerful. Just by removing somebody from their food can be so powerful and destructive, but it's just a part of how it is. And we also think about the, um, you know, what, you know, I talk about it is the eradication of our indigenous education. So if you ask yourself, like, what is indigenous education, right? Indigenous education is something that was given to people. There was no cost on education because you don't necessarily need a cost on education. Uh, teaching something to somebody is as easy as telling them something, you know, or showing them so how to do something, right? Anybody can learn. But for indigenous communities, it was really about taking thousands of years of generational knowledge and passing it down consistently, generation after generation after generation, accumulating all of those life lessons. And all these indigenous communities from all around the world you know, share this commonality of being able to live sustainably utilizing plants and animals around them because of that knowledge of thousands of years of working with those plants and animals and how to live with the seasons and everything right so during um, after this big push to take over the US and Canada um, we see a lot of these children who would, should have been learning that generational knowledge. At the end of the 1800s and, you know, and the beginning of the 1900s, they should have been learning those traditional knowledges that would have been passed down like they should have been, right? But instead, you know, we saw the creation of the boarding school systems where um, these kids, instead of learning um, important things about how to identify plants and create natural medicines and, you know, be connected to the earth and, and the nature and uh, how to hunt, how to fish, how to do everything, how to preserve foods, they're being taught servitude skills like how to sew and how to clean and how to do, make build cabinets and, you know, things like this, right? Um, and it's a really painful time and we lose so much knowledge during this time. It was extremely damaging, you know, and this is a big part of the story of why indigenous communities have struggled so much for so many more so many things like I feel lucky like my tribe has been able to maintain language arts um, some culture some mythology some stories some songs some dances as has have a lot of other indigenous communities out there food was something that was completely wiped off the map for us for the most part when it really comes down to it you know truthfully 
Um, so these boarding school systems created by Richard Pratt, you know, were very intentional of forced assimilation because, you know, we see these boarding school systems pop up all over the United States, especially in these uh, high conflict areas that were happening um, with some of these indigenous groups across the country. Um, and a lot of us, this is very recent, you know. You know, so in Canada, same story, indigenous schools, uh, residential schools is what they call them there, but all over the place, same story. And these were going on up until the 1990s, you know. My mother went to boarding school. A whole bunch of people have family members that went to boarding school, and they're not fun stories. People People do not like to talk about that. You know, this is a boarding school in Pine Ridge, um, and this picture is so powerful to me because the families are setting up camp just to try and be close to their children to see them because they weren't even allowed to see their kids, right? And it's so heartbreaking to, you know, have so just to have so much tradition and life ways taken from you so at such a fast pace. So this forced assimilation happening to indigenous peoples and taking these young children and trying to turn them into something that they're not, forcing them to speak different languages, forcing them to, um, uh, to worship different uh, religions, you know. Um, and again, you know, same thing, teaching them these skills that would be useful if, there was, if people would hire them for something. But obviously we live in, we've been living in a very racist country for so long, nobody was hiring indigenous peoples way back then for, to make a living, right? Um, and these were very forced, like people had to serve, there was harsh punishments for these little kids, you know, that's a, those are a pair of handcuffs designed just for tiny little hands, right? And these are artifacts that are at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, at the, at the school there. Um, and there were stories like making the kids brush their teeth with pumice stone if they were caught speaking their own languages and, and things like that. Those were, those were realities that were happening to those young kids. So for indigenous people, we do really look at that time period in the 1800s as a time of genocide. And if you look at all the steps of genocide, the last one, it's always denial. So whoever commits genocide starts this denial phase of pretending like nothing's that bad, this is just the way of life, if life goes on, we don't even have to talk about it, you know? Um, but that denial is what's really been so damaging because we should be teaching these stories. We should be talking about some of those hard parts in history because that's the only way to move forward to heal for everybody. Because it's not just us that it's happened to, it's happened to a lot of people, you know? But those histories are important and you can't just make up fake history for the betterment of somebody, you know, for the, whoever's the dominant power at the moment, right? We have to understand the true histories of the land that we're standing on, how we got here, and what really happened here, you know? That's the important stories to understand so we can all be on a truthful same page, a starting point. So for me, growing up in uh, growing up with food in post-colonial Native America, you know, I get a lot of media attention. People uh, call me and interview me a lot, and they always ask me that question, like, oh, you're from a reservation. What did you eat growing up? Because they want to hear a story like, oh, we got up in the morning, and I would take down an elk with a bow I made, you know, and we'd have a big community feast, and it'd be awesome. <laughs> You know, but that's not the truth. <laughs> you know, I grew up and my cabinet looked like that uh, without the fresh vegetables in front, which were really just product placement, you know. So, you know, this is a picture of the commodity food program from two years ago. So it actually looks better than it did when I was growing up, because when I was growing up, it was just black and white cans and it would just say beef with juice on it, basically, right? Um, which, I don't know, tasted the same as, looked the same and smelled the same as dog food, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> But, you know, these, this food system, this is what people are still surviving off of today, right? So if you don't know much about the Commodity Food Program, it's a program that's, it's a surplus program that the United States government started in the 1930s to help the, all these um, farmers that had been placed, all these immigrant farmers that were placed all across this kind of newly taken over land or at that stretch to help them so the U.S. government could create a surplus to be able to supply schools with, schools with food, excuse me, hospitals with food um, and reservations too, right? So we're all very familiar with these foods, but the problem is you can't live very healthy off of this kind of food because this was never a nutritional program. This was never a program to make pe pe people healthy, right? 
So if this is all the nutrition that you're getting, it's gonna affect you in a really negative way, which there's, just look at any indigenous community that's been surviving off this food for the past three to four generations, and you're gonna see what that actually does to a group of people. You're gonna see communities with type two diabetes rates up upwards of 60% plus, you know? And it's crazy, because it's high sodium, high carbs, bad fats, poor sugars, overprocessed, all of the bad stuff that we, we can't just survive off of this kind of food, you know? So, and again, when I was looking at a lot of um, Native American cookbooks early on, a lot of it was with this, because that's how people learn how to cook. They learn how to cook with these staples, right? And we also look at this piece, because, you know, I grew up with fry bread, Indian tacos, um, and it was a big piece, a big piece of celebration for us. But then I always thought it a little strange, too, because growing up in Pine Ridge, I'd be like, you know, it's, I love Indian tacos, but it's weird our, like, our Lakota food tastes like Mexican food, you know? <laughs> because, but if you think about, you know, if you, destruct, if you deconstruct, if you decolonize that piece, right, you don't have much left because you don't have any flour because that didn't exist here, the wheat flour, right? That wasn't here. The, those weird California black olives, I don't even know how they make those, but those didn't exist here at all either, you know? Um, the sour cream, you lose that. The cheese, you lose that. Um, the ground beef, you lose that. You basically have beans and onions and tomatoes, which is a pretty cool dish there, right? <laughs> so, but, you know, and it's cool because Indian tacos have been integrated into a lot of indigenous communities and people are very proud and prideful of it. And that part's fine, but it's, all, but it's also something that's not good for you because it is fried bread, right, when it comes down to it. And we can do so much better because this one piece should not represent you know, all of these different diverse communities that are out there, right? We can do so much better with our food systems. So going from there to really understand what is an indigenous food system, you have to really think about, first off, just like how much diversity we have, you know, with the land that we're standing on with these different regions. And this is a very generalized map, but you know, we have deserts and forests and you know, we have all sorts of stuff. We have, you know, coastal regions um, and there's a ton of plant diversity within North America because this is a huge continent, you know, there's a, and there's so much animal diversity there too. But to really think about the diversity that um, happens when you understand an indigenous perspective, um, we like to look at it by overlaying the language maps of the indigenous peoples of North America. Because then you can start to see diversity a lot more clear, right? Because within each one of those mother tongues, there's all sorts of subdialects, and there's also other um, languages within that. Because again, this is also very generalized. And these language maps are very fluid. They don't have hard lines, you know? And for us, it doesn't matter, like, which part of this continent speaks French or English or Spanish? Those are all colonial languages, right? So we really have to look at the backbone, and these kind of maps help you see the diversity from Mexico all the way up through Alaska of how much cool stuff we should be celebrating when it comes to food systems and really understanding the land that we're standing on and the history and the people that have been here forever. So again, where we are today, 634 tri tribes in Canada, um, 573 in the U.S. and you know a fifth of Mexico still speak indigenous language you know so that's a lot of indigenous people still out there today living and surviving through all of that stuff that happened in the 1800s and even this kind of perpetual um, century of oppression that we lived through in the 1900s basically right so for us to understand an indigenous food system it's not just a culinary thing it wasn't just about cooking it wasn't just understanding how to cut up a carrot 20 different ways and naming every little piece. This was really about how people survived because food was a center for, for everybody, right? Food also did not have a price to it. Food was something that people worked really hard for as a community, as a group to make happen. Everybody had to chip in, but everybody was doing something for the food system. You're hunting, you're fishing, you're gathering and foraging, you're gardening and farming, you're building tools to do all of those things, you're teaching your kids how to do that, you're passing down life lessons lessons, all of that stuff. Everybody's doing something that relates to the food system so you can have food because especially in these winter areas, right? You have to make sure that you're on top of all of those pieces to make sure you have enough food to last through the long winters to start the next season again. And that's how people were able to survive in, you know, in the subarctic or way up here in, you know, in these regions, you know, or even in the deserts. But it was understanding all of that. So you have to understand wild foods, 
permaculture, native agriculture, seed saving, seasonal lifestyles, ethno-oceanography, hunting, fishing, butchery, salt, sugar, fat production, indigenous crafting, land stewardship, cooking techniques, regional indigenous histories, indigenous traditional medicine, food preservation, fermentation, nutrition, health, spirituality, all those pieces combined make up these food systems. So for us, we were looking at all of that, right? And really the best place to start was reconnecting with nature, to reconnect with the world around you, specifically where you might be, right? So stop using the term weed because it just means you don't know what it is, right? There's so many plants out there. So when we started looking around and just identifying the plants and understanding that they have names, they have purposes, like every single thing out there has a purpose, right? Except for ticks, everything else has a purpose. <laughs> And mosquitoes, probably. <laughs> but, you know, this is just walking around North Dakota for like an hour and in the middle of summer and just seeing so much food all over the place. And that's exciting as a chef. Like, you know, all of a sudden there's like all these things that we can play with. Because you think about it, indigenous peoples survived off of hundreds of different kinds of plant pieces, right? There's so many different plants in their, in their diets. Today, so many people survive off of probably less than 20 plant species because they buy the same thing at the store. You get a tomato, you get a potato, you get a lettuce, you get a garlic, you get an onion. And you can barely, you could maybe reach 20 after you can name of all the fruits and vegetables that you eat on a yearly basis, right? We can do so much better, again, because there's literally food all around us, right? And that's what was the exciting part for, again, for us as culinary people was just like how much food we could start playing with that really identifies where we, are, where we were all these different flavors you know there was sours there was bitters there was tannic I mean knowing like all this food is medicine too um, understanding how the seasons work um, this is spruce tips and ramp tips um, and I like this picture because I got this from one of the co-ops um, in Minneapolis one of the natural food stores um, in the springtime and I always know when spring is coming because the co-op will start carrying this first coming from the west coast right so they'll be spruce tips from Oregon for $35 a pound or something like that, you know, and ramps are coming in from Washington and they're $35 a pound, right? And then, you know, and then springtime's around the corner and then like, there's a giant spruce tree right outside the store just beaming with these people as people are paying $35 a pound for them, you know? We're so disconnected with our foods, you know? It's all around us. But it's also understanding plants because ramps, like people identify for ramps and they're, they're, they're popular in the rest restaurants when they come around but so many people like just completely kill off so many ramp uh, populations they don't know how the plant works they don't know that it could take six or seven years for the plant to even seed to reproduce right they don't know that if you just leave the tips in the ground those bulbs will split and create more and instead of just pulling everything up and then you know it's taking them to sell them for a high price but then there's nothing left there so it's also taking the time to learn what the who the plants are and to understand them and how to harvest harvest and forage you know sustainably because you know for indigenous people so much respect went into all of that you know people leave tobacco and offerings they sing songs when they're harvesting certain things and they're so connected to those plants because those plants are life-giving you know they're a part of their culture part of their history part of their stories part of their mythology um, so it's really important to understand that connection um, and it's just you know taking the time to learn things that are out there understanding how things like staples work this is a picture of Timsala, which is a prairie turnip, which is a huge staple for so many tribes all across the Great Plains. Or um, this is a picture of camas root in the Pacific Northwest, which again was a huge, huge staple because there was many kinds of plant staples out there. Or here we have um, what is the true wild rice, you know, the natural true wild rice. And we're lucky where we are in Minnesota because we have so much of this wild rice left, but we've lost so much of it in a very, within this last century because wild rice used to grow all the way out to New York, right? There's some people starting to seed some more here in Michigan, but mostly it's condensed into Wisconsin, Minnesota, parts of Canada. All that black wild rice that you guys probably know from the grocery store or from rice roni boxes, that stuff's all from California mostly, some in Canada, but it was, you know, modified to be patty rice basically so they can use machinery to harvest it. So it's a completely different being because 
the natural wild rice that we have is just a completely different thing. And it's so special, you know, to so many people because this stuff doesn't take any petroleum to harvest at all. It likes really clean, cold waters. So Michigan should be growing out a ton of it and could be because it used to. But the waterways have to be clean and it has to be cold. Um, and, you know, it takes some time to get there. But it really helps the lakes and the soils and everything. And it's such a wonderful, awesome staple. You know, so that's one of the reasons why we have to really think about why it's important to protect a lot of those waterways and a lot of those natural resources because we've lost so many already for what? Corporations who make a fast buck destroy the environment and then leave, you know? They get off the hook for all of that constantly. So we take the time to, to use our voices if we have them to talk about. Like, we have to hang, hang on to these natural resources. And there could be a good economic supply chain. You know, so a lot of the tribes in Minnesota are able to make a, lot, a pretty decent, um, um, some pretty decent wages off of um, selling and harvesting a lot of these wild rice pieces. Because they've been making families happy for a long time out there, right? And, you know, t talking about water, it's also that knowledge of all the water plants because it doesn't just stop on, stop on the land. There's all sorts of plants under the water that the indigenous peoples knew how to utilize and how to harvest and when to harvest also out there. And they've been doing it for a long, long time, right? Or we think about the desert where all the plants look like they want to maim you or hurt you or kill you. For indigenous peoples, they know how to live with them, you know, um, and, you know, it's really important because it's, it's really kind of silly to use the term food desert because there's so much awesome food in the desert as the indigenous peoples who lived there for thousands of years knew and know today, right? So there's, and, but also taking care of these things, you know, because, and utilizing them very sparingly, only taking what you need, so not overdoing it. Um, we also really look at North American indigenous agriculture, which is widely unsung. You know, it's so important and it's something that's not even talked about or taught about hardly at all, you know, because the way our high school books have us think, they just make us think like this whole land was just completely wide open for the taking and there's, you know, it's just going to be all sorts of awesome farms to start out there. But there was many, many people growing stuff all over the place. There was native farms all over the place, right? Because native agriculture really starts in the bottom of Mexico. It shoots both directions. So it goes throughout the entire Caribbean, throughout Mexico, all along the eastern seaboard, um, all the way up the Mississippi, Missouri River. So this region all the way up into parts of Canada in the east you know so like huge area of where indigenous agriculture was happening because we're so you know we're stuck in this time of monoculture right now which we know is destructive for the soil and we're learning more and more about it every year so really returning to the sustainable life because you know the thing is like indigenous people had been living here a long time agriculture had been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years right and this country was not fucked up when Europeans showed up right this was was a pretty good land space, right? <laughs> so, you know, we think about the Three Sisters Garden, which you guys had that question on, you know, but this is a very specific style of farming and gardening because of that mass diversity that we have of indigenous cultures across who were all over the place. There were so many different styles of agriculture happening, right? So we're just now starting to learn more about how, um, how advanced the Mayan were when it came to agriculture, because we already know how advanced they were with um, architecture, astrology, astronomy, you name it, right? But agriculture was something else that they were really on top of. And it's fun to share that connection with Mayan people because of that corn culture that goes back so many thousands of years. Um, looking at what the Spanish saw when they first get to Mexico City, um, there's floating gardens, but they're, they're actually just raised beds because uh, the, the whole city was built on a real low-lying you know, water area. But it was a really cool agricultural system where they're able to churn that soil, grow really a ton of clean um, foods, utilizing that really clean water that they kept really clean um, because of all that fish life and everything in the water. Just had so many nutrients for that soil just to pump out a ton of awesome food you know, for this huge metropolis and area. Or looking at in the middle of the desert, 
Um, so this is a Zuni farm um, in New Mexico, um, and they figured out a, a thing called the waffle system, but they were able to grow, you know, for again, for hundreds of generations, awesome seeds that eventually became heat resistant and drought resistant and were able to thrive in a desert area. And that's a huge human feat to be able to pull that off, right? And, there's, and again, you're seeing the same kinds of seeds. You're seeing corns, um, squash, sunflower seeds, amaranths, chili peppers, um, tobacco. You're seeing all these wonderful uh, seed varietals um, following each other, right? Um, or you go way up north here. This is in North Dakota. This woman's name is Buffalo Bird Woman. She's a Hadatsa. Um, she's living right on the Missouri River Valley, which you can see behind her, right? And it's not too far from where the whole Standing Rock thing was going down. But she, there's a book out on her called Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden. So if you guys have any interest in this stuff, you should definitely find that book because it's a really unique perspective on indigenous agriculture from an indigenous person. But what's really rare about it is it's an indigenous female voice that comes through that time point in history when you never barely hear female voices, let alone an indigenous female voice, right? So it's a really special, wonderful um, book that she just talks about the life of her garden throughout one season from start to finish with the seeds, keeping upkeep with everything, you know, some bits about food up to, to harvest season and then putting everything into food caches. And it's so well detailed, you know? So it's such a great book because we're lucky that we have any indigenous seed variety left at all because at the time period when the US government was opening up the floodgates for a lot of immigrant farmers to become rushing in to take over these newly conquered lands they were supplying them with their own seeds so they were bringing in stuff that they didn't really have before right so we lost a lot of that diversity so it's just really important to think about how special and unique these pieces are and how we should be celebrating some of these seeds that have been in some of our particular areas for so long you know so there's so much beautiful diversity still left alive today, but we have no idea or could even begin to calculate how much we've lost over the past two centuries. So for us, you know, it's seeing the beauty in those and seeing all of this diversity that indigenous communities still hold today with the seeds, with the beans, with the squash. Um, and, uh, you know, for us, it's also looking at uh, one other piece is just how people were processing all these foods, which is another beautiful story. Um, wherever corn culture went, the nixtamalization of corn followed it. So nixtamalization is kind of a long word, right? And it's hard to rhyme, but um, <laughs> what it is, it's a really important piece because wherever it went, so it's basically people were taking wood ash, putting it in water, which um, scientifically creates an alkaline bath, right? So when you're cooking this corn in this alkaline bath, this dried corn, first it kind of loosens up the outer shell of the corn, which eventually will, can rub off, and it swells the kernel itself. But the most important thing that happens is that it makes the corn soluble for your body to absorb the needed nutrients that the corn has. So it unlocks the corn essentially, basically. So if you do that process, then you get high amounts of calcium, potassium, magnesium, iron, zinc, and it's really important, right? So when Europeans first discovered corn in the New World, they started bringing it back to Europe and they're um, putting it in colonies that they had newly founded in like Africa and some, you know, different parts of Europe. But they were making people really sick by trying to feed them only dried corn product because they didn't know or take the time to learn about the process that everybody in the Americas was utilizing both north and south. Because again, think about corn culture shooting both north and south into the Americas, you know, from Mexico and everywhere that that went, people were utilizing that nixtamalization process, right? So it's a really important piece, um, and we use it all the time, and people still do it very traditionally in many different ways, you know? I've talked to elders in South Dakota, excuse me, South Dakota that have been using like this traditional method in the Northeast, in the Southwest, in Mexico. It's the same all over. It's the same process. And you get the same effect of having a really healthy pr uh, product to live off of. We also look at food preservation, how people were saving food and how resourceful and unwasteful indigenous peoples were because food was precious and you don't just throw it away. 
So we like to think like, what would happen if one single grocery store just took the time to pull fruits and vegetables, dry them out before they went bad, and how much food stock they would save that's healthy, right? They would save so much instead of just like, we're so wasteful as a community. Like we don't even want to know like how much food does, you know, an institutional kitchen throw away, right? Or a hospital or even, you know, an airport or whatever. We just throw so much food away or most of our system just goes right into the trash, you know? So we can be doing so much better, especially on a smaller scale, we're able to, if we're able to control it better, we can just be thinking about how can we be more resourceful and push ourselves to, to go for those things. Like We have to figure it out. Because there's going to be a lot of people in the future, and we have to figure out how to feed them. And it's not that we're making enough food, it's that we're throwing away too much food, really, when it comes down to it, right? So for us... You know, as chefs, like we made the conscious decision to be careful. So when we're utilizing some of these beautiful heirloom pieces, we always take the time to save those seeds, to dry them out, and to get them back into the hands of the farmers and growers around us who can grow them out. Because one cool squash is going to create a whole bunch more seeds, which can create a whole bunch more, right? And it just keeps going. And that's the beauty of seed keeping and farming and gardeners, you know? And, it's, and you have to go full circle with that food. It has to come all the way around. And so it's really important. So for us, reclaiming indigenous foodways in a modern world, you know, how, did we, how can we even think about doing that to take all this knowledge? So first it was just understanding this knowledge, this past, right? And then starting to utilize it and apply it. So I started hiring some young native chefs who were interested in coming on board and uh, taking the time every year to be outdoors in the seasons and utilizing a lot of these plants. Um, you know, even hired an ethnobotanist on my crew right away because I think every culinary crew should have an ethnobotanist on board because all we do is play with plants. We're chopping up plants all the time, right? And, you know, it's, uh, and she just helped us so much because, like, I studied a lot of wild foods and I got pretty good at it myself, but she was classically trained in it and it just helped us unlock so much more at such a faster rate. And plus it was so much easier to teach an ethnobotanist to cook than a cook ethnobotany. <laughs> right? But... You know, when you start seeing food, it's all around us, like we said, it's everywhere, you know. You just have to open your eyes, understand that every single plant, again, has a purpose, and you can find, and there's so much, you see so much more edible food out there than you even know about. It's right outside our back door, and we can be doing so much better. And, you know, we're taking the time to harvest all of these different herbs and spices that just grow naturally around us and all these wonderful flavors that are new to so many people because they never tried them even though they walk by them every day. You know, a lot of us, you know, taste these foods that are really from here and be like, wow, I've never really tried anything like that. We started calling it ironically foreign, right? But taking the time to dry things out, grind things into powder, and just build our own pantry, because we could, of stuff that's right around us. I didn't have to use my mom's handed down spice rack from the 1950s, right? Because I don't even know how old. Like, you just have to throw that stuff away after a while, really. <laughs> you know, it's so scary. And, like, and to me, it, it reminds me of like Folgers, too. Like, you have no idea how old. This could be like pre war. Be coffee beans you have no idea that stuff could be so old you know <laughs> right so you know and it was fun to like just you know create an awesome crew have a lot of fun create a bunch of fun foods make foods taste like where you are you know this is rabbit cedar wild rice cranberries maple you can stand on one lake look around you and see all those pieces without even moving you could just identify it all just looking around you right so you could just make food taste exactly like where you are and that's how we should be treating food we should be really understanding the history of where we are because the thing with farm to table we're growing a bunch of plants that don't necessarily even belong here which is fine because plants are awesome and we love veggies for sure but i'm just saying there's so much more plants that love this soil love this region and we could be really celebrating a lot of the plants that are particularly from our regions to really help us stand out regionally you know because we should be able to drive across North America any direction and stopping at little native restaurants to experience how much diversity is out there right instead of driving straight across and seeing the exact same hamburger and craft beer every stop you make everything tastes the same or if you're in Canada just the same poutine over and over right <laughs> 
we again we can just we can be doing better and it's fun for us as chefs because you can put artistry on the plate but what was more what was more important was the stories behind each of those food pieces right the artistry is just something that we apply to it because it's something we love to do and if you love something you're gonna create artistry around what you do right that's just part of what we do is making food be fun and look pretty but it was really like the story was the food was telling the story and just keeping it simple it was just a matter of a couple ingredients you know and letting it be what it is creating um, businesses this was our food truck Tatanka truck where we did the same kind of situation where we did uh, micro regional foods where we just focused on the foods of Minnesota and of the Minnesota Dakota region so it's primarily the foods of just Dakota and Ojibwe right there right so and there's no sugars there's no sodas there's no gatorades there's no orange drink you know um, we're and we we're also a little bit worried because we we're going to open up this cool food truck and we knew there wasn't going to be fry bread on it so we didn't know if we we're just going to piss off every native in town right away or what <laughs> but it worked you know we did just healthy indigenous foods we cut out all colonial ingredients there's no wheat flour no dairy no processed cane sugar we didn't even use beef pork and chicken just to prove the point that we could because there's plenty of fish and birds and animals we had rabbits and venison elk and bison all sorts of stuff and we could do it and we could do it anywhere you know we did the James Beard House dinner a couple of years ago now but we did just the indigenous foods of Manhattan because we knew the history and how to figure it out we could search for indigenous seeds of that region and uh, fishermen in that region who could harvest some of the sea, uh, seafood that's particularly from right there and some of the wild foods of that region like it's doable because we all it is is just knowledge and we can figure it out and so um, for us though the more important part was really going to the indigenous communities and being able to serve this food because some of these elders haven't even had these flavors since they were kids right and it's so powerful to hear these elders come up with all of these stories they're like oh I forgot all about this flavor you know my grandmother used to harvest this when we were kids and we used to know where the paths were in the forest to go get it at this time of year or, or we'd swim out to the, the swim out in this lake all the way across to this island and harvest these special things and come back again you know and all these stories that they would tell after tasting these foods that they've been kept from for way too long so it was really it's really important for us to try to figure out how to get that out there so for our vision what we really wanted to do is try to figure out how can we figure out how to design. There needs to be more indigenous food everywhere. We didn't want to just do one restaurant in Minneapolis, you know. We wanted to figure out how can we do this more and more. So we created a nonprofit called Natives or North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems. Um, and what our focus is, is a couple of key points. First is, is indigenous education. Um, we also want to create indigenous food access to make this food accessible. And we also really want to help business development and be a support system to help develop more indigenous food producers out there and to create more opportunities um, for people by creating a lot of this demand. So we're doing it through a brand called Indigenous Food Lab that we're opening up, we're trying to open up this summer in Minneapolis. And what Indigenous Food Lab is, it's a 501c3 nonprofit restaurant, which was really hard to get from the IRS. They did not like the idea at all, and it took a lot of arguing, but we were able to push them through. Now we have a nonprofit restaurant scenario. Um, and it's a live restaurant. It's really built for skills, because we told the IRS, like, Training is one thing, but on-the-job training is so valuable. So we want a live restaurant because people can work with us and learn so much faster, right? And that's how we got through that. Um, so we also want to create a native uh, classroom kitchen where people can actually learn a lot of this indigenous education that's not being taught. There's so much indigenous education that we could be sharing. So utilizing our skills to build these curriculums and bringing on more people to help us teach and become a center for people to learn about these kinds of things and give us an opportunity to research and develop so we can continue to build more and more curriculum and play with food more because I really just want to play with food really is what I want to do. <laughs> um, uh, being able to develop a lot of this stuff to show the complexities of indigenous food systems but having a place that can actually talk about it and teach it in real time making it accessible also for indigenous peoples because again I don't really like the idea of education having a big price tag. We can just be giving away a lot of this information and a nonprofit for us was really the way to help rebuild a lot of that knowledge, especially in the indigenous communities. Utilizing things like our first cookbook, which is out, um, unfortunately we don't have any um, on us today, but it's on our website. 
Um, but, you know, over 100 recipes using only indigenous ingredients and cutting out all the colonial stuff. So everything's gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, soy-free, pork-free. You know, it's like an ideal diet, right? So our goal is to open up this first one in the city in Minneapolis. And the reason we want to open up in the city is because the city just has a lot more resources, right? But the goal of this whole project is to reach out, branch out to our tribal communities around us to help them to develop their own indigenous food entity for their community and to really you know, help them so there's that, to create that food access that's needed so that there's at least one place they can get healthy food, right? When I grew up on Pine Ridge, there was no restaurants. I think today there's a Taco John's, a Pizza Hut, and a Subway right? But that doesn't help anything either at all. So we need something that can be particular to them, to their region, to their land, to their history, and help make that, a, make that happen. Use a lot, utilizing the Indigenous Food Lab in the city as the main training and support system center to help make all those little satellites work, right? Because that's really the goal of what Indigenous Food Lab is going to be, help the development, um, be support system all the time, and be the con consistent training. So if they have new staff, they can always come back through us, take our classes, work at the restaurant, get them back into the community to use those lessons for where they are. And we really want to push for those communities to create more community gardens and having a place that can process that food is so important, you know. So those little satellites hopefully will create more uh, communities. We can send educators up there to help them. We can connect them with the seeds that they need to grow, give them the lessons, give them the toolkit that they need to survive, right? Give them everything and getting them to understand permaculture landscape because we should just be putting food everywhere we can, you know. Lawns are stupid. You got to put food everywhere. Like that's a waste of space and a waste of energy when you could just be putting in, um, indigenous plants everywhere berries nut trees um, all sorts of stuff like we could be better we can landscape any way we want to and we should be landscaping with plants that grow well in our regions and that are just pumping out tons of food especially for communities that struggle with food access we don't have to be like that we can just put food everywhere you don't have to wander around the forest looking for stuff if we just create huge groves of it right um, and you know taking the time to for mentorships and apprenticeships we hope to bring in a lot of people through here and we hope to even have professional classes so maybe other chefs around the country can come and work with us to understand how to apply this on a larger level on an institutional level right um, and hopefully be an uh, incubator for more people to develop indigenous food businesses because we need more indigenous food production and it's a great economic opportunity for people out there because like on Pine Ridge I think today is still the uh, I think the unemployment rates around 90 percent you know Know, that's rough you know and that's better than it was when I was growing up and if you think about like that sounds bad like when the country was in the Great Depression the unemployment rate hit 25 percent but to have a community that's only known 90 percentile unemployment is insane right but that's another reality that's out there so our main goal is to open up indigenous food labs in big cities all over the nation, all over everywhere, really, to have each one of those do the same work, to satellite around it, to help create more of those. Then you could drive across North America, stopping at all these cool, unique indigenous restaurants and see the amazing diversity and health that's out there, because the health is the best part of it all, right? Um, oh, I forgot, we have to pause for another um, thing. Did we do this one? Oh, okay, you guys got this one. So, <laughs> do you guys remember though? I'm gonna do that. <laughs> All right. Anyways, moving on. Sorry. So for us, this really is an indigenous evolution and revolution because we're not just trying to create a timepiece, but we're trying to actually make a scenario where we're learning as much as we can from our ancestors in the past, apply it to today, and evolve it for the future. And that's really what we're trying to do. The best thing you can do is your in your lifetime is set up the next generation. That's how far you have to look ahead. It's not just about yourself. It's like, what are you going to do that's actually going to last? What's going to make a difference, right? So for us, building the framework for the next generation is the best thing we to do, we can do, like give them the toolkit that they need to survive off of because they're the ones that are going to be the next leaders and we want them to understand health and why it's important to protect our natural resources, the ones that we have left. It's going to be a big fight with corporations out there with waterways, with agriculture, with seeds, all of those things are going to be really hot points coming up and we have to give our kids the tools and the knowledge that they need to not just be, you know, just, just to go with the flow. They need to understand how they need to fight for what's important, right? 
So moving forward, you know, we have a lot of work to do, but we're hoping that we can grow. We're hoping we can bring a lot more people on. We're hoping that we can give a lot of these kids jobs, and we're hoping that they become the next leaders when it comes to indigenous food waste. Because really, when it comes down to it, and again, looking forward, you know, you can be the, uh, the answer to your ancestors' prayers, and you have to be that, you know, be that answer to your ancestors' prayers, right? So for us from indigenous communities, it's really important to think that way, because we have a lot of revitalization and repair work to do but we can do it there's a path there and it's through food it's the one thing that can that we all have in common no matter who we are so thank you guys So we're going to do a couple of questions and answers, right? Um. So raise your hands and we'll come around. When we give you the mic, please tell us your name and something brief about kind of your role in the food system. We'd like to know who's in the audience. Hi, Hi. Uh, my name is Meryl. I'm an undergraduate student uh, I am mostly involved as an environment minor, but I also help run a local produce um, service platform um, on campus. <laughs> um, I'm just curious, first off, thank you so much for coming and talking, that was really wonderful. Um, I'm curious, you talked a lot about um, plant knowledge and seeds, and you mentioned one dish with the rabbit and um, cedar. I'm curious what the practices is around um, animals, and do you have similar education on how um, indigenous peoples used to be cultivating them and how they incorporate that in food? Yeah, for sure. And you know, we spent a lot of time understanding uh, protein for sure. And I felt like protein was all the always the easier piece because anybody can break down an animal and get the protein off of it and understand utilizing the entire animal for something because that's been um, a big part of just culinary education in general you know so I grew up you know my grandparents had a ranch so we had cattle so we ate every little part of, we ate every single part of the cow eventually because it would just get we'd process an entire cow go in the freezer and throughout the season we would just eat every little piece of it right studying lots of other cuisines but Indigenous people was extremely resourceful. So the bones had purposes, you know, the different fats had purposes. And a lot of those knowledges are out there. And they're really, really important, of course. And even just like, you know, when you're harvesting an animal and the amount of ceremony and prayer that goes into it is another big part of it because it's that connection and the thankfulness that comes out of it, too. So there's a lot of that. And we really chose to really focus on the plants because we felt like that connection to the earth was something that was really, really needed. And you can get proteins in lots of different ways. So actually, most of our recipes end up being vegan because we cut out, you know, the dairy and all of that stuff. So if it doesn't have animals in it, then it's just completely plant-based. And we just really liked that approach to it because we just wanted to create health. And we don't have to eat so much protein as we do today. You don't need a 36-ounce steak, you know, when you go to, out to a restaurant, you know. Some of us do, I think, but most of we don't really need it. But, you know, and, you like, and thinking about insects is another alternative protein source. So thinking about all the alternative proteins because all animals are literally game when it comes down to it. We've cooked all sorts of stuff throughout this, just this last year. You know, we've had muskrats and squirrel and beaver and elk and, you know, any, we have all sorts of stuff, you know. So it's just being open that there are more animals than just beef, pork, and chicken out there, which those industries, of course, everybody loves those pieces, but they're so destructive too. And we can be thinking on a micro scale, and we don't have to eat as much protein as we're, as we're kind of forced to think that we have to for every single meal, for breakfast, lunch, dinner. You don't need all that combined protein weight in your diet, you know. So, but yeah, there's a lot of cool lessons out there. Yeah. Right here. <clears throat> Hi, Sean. Hi. Hi, my name is Shiloh, and I help to coordinate a uh, food sovereignty project in the Detroit urban indigenous community. And a question that I hear a lot is how can non indigenous people show appreciation for? Uh, our foods and our culture without appropriating. And I would li like to hear your thoughts on yeah. that. Yeah. 
So we talk about cultural appropriation quite a bit because it is an important thing. It's a hot topic a lot because you see some fads come in like Mex like Oaxacan cuisine's hot right now, you know. Some of the top chefs of the nation are creating this. But the last thing indigenous people want is people like basically columbusing their cuisine, right? Saying, Oh, look what I discovered, you know. <laughs> and I'm gonna open up a restaurant, make a lot of money and fame off of it. You know, but that's happening all the time and it's probably gonna happen with indigenous foods at a certain point point in time too it's really just going into the respect of it you know and if you're really respecting the culture then you're but you know if you're if you are making a ton of money off of it and none of that's going to the indigenous culture then that's that's appropriation really when it comes down to it you're taking advantage of something right so but if you're building a business that is somehow giving back you know um, if it's funneling money education something giving back then there's more of a respect line there you know and that doesn't mean and just hiring a bunch of Mexican dishwashers either, right? That means really taking the time to be thoughtful of it moving forward because we are in a in a, a world where we can be thoughtful of other cultures really and really try to understand. And food is such a great way to understand other people's cultures. But again, like we have to really identify what our culture's foods are, and especially for Native American and indigenous peoples throughout the U.S. and Mexico and Canada and Alaska. It's going to take some time for us to rebuild a lot of our food structure that was completely destroyed and to really set the tone for what it's all about and not people to just jump on the bandwagon to do it because it's a hot new fad, you know. So really it's about being conscious when it comes down to it and understanding like are you really helping or, or are you just appropriating. Way in the back. Did our Detroit team get here? <coughs> Welcome! Yay! Hi, I'm Nana Brichum. I'm a grad student. Great talk. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, I'm just curious. So do you know if any of the varieties for the Three Sisters are still around? When I was an undergrad, my advisor was Jane Mount Pleasant. I'm sure you know of her. She's Iroquois. Um, but I never actually asked her about that. And I'm sure it would play a difference in like the strength of the system because there's so much diversity within species, too. Yeah, so there's can you a, speak on that? A there's a lot of cool stuff still out there today. So like I'm going to an indigenous farming conference in Minnesota at the end of this month, which is a great gathering. Um, there's one coming up at, uh, what's the tribe? Is it Pokagon, right? So there's gonna be a really great conference coming up there where there's gonna be a lot of people. There's just a lot of amazing seed keeping and preservation and revitalization happening right now today. Like I'm on the board with Seed Savers Exchange based in Decorah, Iowa. Um, they're a nonprofit. They're one of the country's oldest heirloom seed keep, keeping places. You know, I think their seed bank has uh, I want to say it's close to 50,000 seed varietals or something like that of all sorts of stuff. Um, the, the person who's in charge of it right at this moment, her name is Rowan White. Um, and she's been uh, running a program with them to dig through their archives to find any seeds that, um, any native seeds that just maybe got into their vaults but haven't been grown out for a while. And she pulled out like almost over 100 of them. They grew out 25 of them this year just to get them back into the hands of other growers around the country. So being able to return some of these seeds that haven't seen the light of day for so long. A lot of these seeds actually were just collected and then just went stagnant. So places like Field Museum, you can find hundreds of thousands of different kinds of corn but they didn't take care of them they just bagged them and threw them into the basement basically and they just sat there for too long and then they eventually die out you know it would be a very slim chance that you could germinate any of those seeds at that stage it would be like a miracle basically when it comes down to it but there is a lot of cool stuff out there um, there's tons of people online like if you guys follow us on social medias you know we post a lot of uh, other groups doing this lot of all this other cool work so you can slowly get connected into that vein or just you know reach out looking for some of these cool native indigenous food conferences that are happening around the country in different uh, regions too so there's a lot of cool stuff out there so we feel really lucky that we have so much diversity still left today anyone else hi I'm Jeremy Mog Taylor I'm the program manager for the campus farm here at the University of Michigan which is at the Matha Botanical Gardens nice um, we have a student kind of managed and run space out there, and there's a student org, the permaculture design team. If you guys are super excited about this, they would love, they're small, they would love you to join them. Um, <laughs> but if you would, could you recommend, and just make up a random number, five um, unique, interesting kind of upland plants that would be perennial 
that someone might plant in this region that you think like represent some real culinary like either uniqueness or fun or yeah I are think, just cool you know really when it comes down to it there's just so much to play with out there because there's so many different kinds of wild berries around us right which is a great place to start there's so many of the nut trees that we could be utilizing you know which and some of them like hickories can be really a pain but they could are black walnuts but they're really worth it once you get them you know and there's all sorts of the the wild gingers and the wild onions and you know the different kinds of tubers hopness things like that that can grow really well with some of these pieces and it's like knowing which plants can grow and which kind of like you know acidity and which kind of soil and stuff like that so the permaculture community I mean I really love it there's some really smart um, people out there and I think we can really turn things around because we really want to push for that world where we can just be utilizing all of our landscape to be processing or to be growing food so we can be harvesting and collecting them you know but I'd be happy to you know connect with you guys and shoot you a bunch of ideas if you wanted to you can always just reach out anytime Thank you. yeah of course anybody else out there in the back Uh, hi, my name's Sam. Thanks for talking to us this evening. I really appreciate it. Um, I am an AmeriCorps service member, and I am currently uh, working for uh, Michigan's Land Grant University, uh, Michigan State. Sorry, guys. Um, and running into some very serious issues with the rhetoric around food. Obviously, it's a big agriculture school. There's a lot of history there. And so my question for you is, how can I best decolonize my 4-H curriculum? Because that's what I do. I teach kids. <laughs> I know. That's, what, that's what, Ironically, yeah, just bear with me here. I, I want to make sure that these kids are getting exposed to true histories and, and the true beauty of, of what our indigenous cultures have to offer in this country. And so what would be the best way in your mind to do that without teaching a 4,000 level history of colonialism class? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, at the start of it is just talking about it a lot, getting those kids outdoors, identifying stuff, you know, because you can just show, especially young kids, you can just show them a few plants to harvest and obviously show them what poison ivy looks like too, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you can, you know, you, you know, just get them out there, and they, kids really enjoy being outdoors. And you know, really, they you get they get to run around, be fresh. They're away from their video screens, and and you get a free salad in the end when it comes down to it, right? So. Um, it's just, you know, slowly implementing that thought process more and more into it and building that respect into them of these other cultures and not appropriating it at all, you know. So it's not about making paper mache headbands and uh, turkey hand jive thingies, whatever those are, you know. And so like, but it's really the true histories and how people really were utilizing all this food and all this food really is medicine too when it comes down to it. So it's just having those conversations and, you know, making sure that they're exposed to that, that viewpoint and that perspective. Good. Hi, my name is Kibibi, and I work with the Detroit Food Policy Council in Detroit. Hi. Um, hi. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your vision about you know revolutionizing the food system across um, the continent. I really you you talked you said one thing about you know using food to bring different communities together. Um, and people with different cultural backgrounds together. And I was wondering, so what are some of the strategies you use for uniting different communities around food? And what uh, kind of success or experiences have you seen through that process? Uh, you know, I really think that, again, pushing for more uh, micro-regional food programs, you know, getting smaller communities to work together on their food. Because you can't just have one person that does it all. You need somebody who can do the community garden and help maintain it, help for, or, you know, have people who can go outdoors and help forage and teach other people, um, getting people to help create the permaculture design if they can do it, having a kitchen that can process it and the people in there who know how to do that, how to preserve everything. 
And like we can cre create community pantries that are, you know, indigenous and from stuff around us if we take the time and really work together to do it. But we need group efforts when it comes down to it, you know. And we have to respect all of our uh, various cultures, you know, because we have to, there's so many of us from so many different places and we have to respect all of these knowledges that come from so many different parts of the world. But we really have to apply it to where we happen to be right now. And if we really work hard on the food, we can do that. And especially for small communities that struggle with food like you know if you can control your food you can control your destiny is when it comes down to it right that's what keeps us alive is what makes everything important so it's really taking that time to push for that sense and food isn't just about money you can work hard together to really make it happen and reap the benefits by having lots of healthy food but it really takes a lot of people to jump on board to that and hopefully um, creating more programs for younger kids so they grow up with that understanding and that knowledge so they can be a part of that too. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of work to do for sure. There's one down here. Here's one. Hello, my name is Danielle and I'm a student and an activist and I'm trying to help my friend uh, access indigenous recipes from like his culture and I am having trouble doing research or helping with that. What have been like the most successful um, like research methods that you used? Uh, which part of the country? Uh, New Mexico. New Mexico. So there's quite a bit of stuff going down and there's a great cookbook on Pueblo cooking that's down uh, that's out right now already. Um, and again, it's just kind of applying some of these lessons that we have. So like in our cookbook, we have some of those pieces like the, the, like the big medicine wheel that has all the different food points in it to really think about that. But it's thinking about, you know, which communities around him were growing, uh, which kind of corns and what kind of, diver uh, what kind of varieties are still out there today, beans and the style that they're growing everything in too. So there's a lot of awesome work happening down in New Mexico and the Southwest and Arizona in general. Um, so it's just connecting with some of the stuff that's already out there would probably be the best way to move about it because um, we I go down there a couple of times a year and there's so much awesome work happening down there and there's so much tradition that's really been able to maintain and survive from those from that area um, so there's a lot to learn so it's really part of its plugging into those communities and plugging into what's already happening and you know hopefully becoming a part to help it grow more if he wants to so yeah I think we should probably end there. Let's give Sean another round of applause. Thank you, Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.